and for the presentation. Um, I am very happy to be here, even though far away physically, but uh, it is a way to feel a little bit in Turkey also during the winter months when I'm back over here. And um, let me share my screen so that <clears throat> we can start. Uh, as you can imagine, um, talking about Arzalan Tepe uh, in a little less than one hour is not easy. It is not easy to decide what to say. Uh, excavations by La Sapienza University have been going on now for 60 years, and you can surely imagine that Arzalan Tepe is now not simply an archaeological site as to say a place where excavations uh, take place but it is um, a place where conservation preservation of archaeology of adobe um, also takes place where we do a lot of uh, public archaeology where we work with community stakeholders uh, so it there are many topics um, that we could uh, tackle talking about Arzlan Tepe. Since this is the first time that we talk at Bill Kent, I thought that maybe the best thing would just to sort of run through the history of the site. So run through what we know was the history of Arzlan Tepe in the past and that we have learned in these 50 years of excavation. Um, uh, before doing this, very quickly, who works at Arzlan Tepe? So the excavation uh, expedition is led by Sapienza University, uh, Marcella Frangipane, with whom I work, and I have worked for more than 25 years, has been a director and she has worked at the site for 40 years, and everything that I will tell you today is a uh, result of her um, directorship at the excavation. Uh, but today Arzalan Tepe is a place where more than 20 or, uh, different institutions work from many different countries. I have uh, a list here. Oops, my PowerPoint is not proceeding. It's stuck. Mm. Oh, don't see the slide moving, right? No, they don't move. Okay, let me do it this way then. Okay. Um, okay, here you see just quickly a list of the main institutions that work uh, at Arzlan Tepe. So that means uh, researchers and scholars belonging to these institutions. And as you can see, the variety of research that takes place is also very uh, wide. Um, but there is another thing I have to say before starting. Our main collaborators are the people of Orduzu. So Arzalan Tepe is in uh, the Malatya province, five kilometers more or less from the city center, uh, in a small town that is called Orduzu. And uh, since 1961, the people who have uh, made the excavation possible are our workmen, uh, people who live around the site and people not only who excavate with us, but look care, um, care for the site. So look after the site when we are not there and also when we are there. Arslan Tepe is their site and they feel it this way. So uh, our enormous thanks go to them. Um, Arzlan Tepe is a small mound. It is a typical mound. So Tel or Tepe, say it in the language you prefer. It's small, four and a half hectares more or less, 30 meters high at least. Um, and in these 30 meters, there are at least uh, 5,000 years of continuous history. Um, we have excavated these 5,000 years in these 60 uh, years of excavation. Um, but uh, first of all, why did Italians start excavating at the site? So Arzalan Tepe was known for its um, Neo-Hittite uh, presence at the site. The statues that you see are now in Ankara, um, but they were visible on the mound so people knew that the site uh, was a Hittite 
um, site already in the beginning of the 20th century where travelers from Europe came and visited the place and uh, the French uh, excavated the site first in the 30s and then very briefly after World War II looking for these uh, Hittite uh, phases of occupation um, at Arslan Tepe. The same thing made the Italians. So when Italians came over in 1961, Professor Puglisi with Merigi, they were looking for Hittite uh, occupation phases. We could say they were looking for tablets. Hmm? Uh, so they started Oops, I forgot I had put this in just to show you. They were traveling by car from Rome uh, every year. We do the same thing 60 years after. This hasn't changed very much. Um, and I just wanted to show you some pictures from those periods. Here is Marcella Frangipane in the 70s together with Alba Palmieri. Uh, maybe the pointer would be useful, who was uh, director of excavations before Marcella. Um, again, here some of the uh, Italian uh, team working at the site and on the right you see Robert Braidwood with Linda Braidwood visiting uh, the excavation when, at the time in which uh, Puglisi was director of excavations. Um, again, some pictures just to have, show you the feeling. So we belong to that place. 60 years of, uh, of passing. It was four months at that time. It's two and a half more or less now. We, we are related to the people who live in Orduzu. And this is very important for us because we are part of the life there. So excavation started, as I was saying, in the 60s on the northern part of the mound looking for Hittite occupation. Uh, that was the area in which the French had found the Neo-Hittite Lion's Gate and so it was where we knew so that uh, probably Hittite phases of occupation would have been found. Uh, the first 10 years of excavation, this is where work concentrated, but then in the beginning of the 1970s, Puglisi, together with Alba Panieri, opened an area which was soon to become the main excavation area on the southwestern part of the mound. Uh, they did this because they wanted to find uh, prehistoric occupation phases that they had identified in the northern part of the mound, but uh, the um, extension to which they could would open uh, the trenches over there was very small. So 1970s, this area started uh, to be investigated and it, it was soon clear that that was the main, was to become the main interest of research. Um, here you see briefly a synthesis of the phases uh, of occupation that in these 60 years have come to light. Uh, most of them were uncovered in this southwestern area that I have showed you. Um, and so we know today that um, settlement at Arzlan Tepe starts possibly in the Neolithic. There's um, halaf pottery on the surface, but the phases that we have excavated, so that we have exposed for the moment, start in the late Calcolithic, so late Calcolithic 1. Uh, and go up uninterruptedly until the destruction of the, the site by Sargon II of Assyria. And then there is an interruption in occupation, which uh, starts again in the Roman Byzantine period. And the life at the site will end with a Byzantine uh, necropolis or cemetery, of which I shall not talk about today. Um, the so i was saying this area um, is where we have the majority of excavation that has taken place and again i will show you some of the images uh, from those early seven 1970s uh, to give you the idea of what the archaeologists were feeling about the discoveries that were taking place here. They immediately understood that what was being uncovered on this area of the mound was something very important, something uh, exceptional. Um, this is 
uh, one of the side rooms of a temple of late Calcolithic five period. Uh, and look at the monumentality. These are adobe, so mud brick walls uh, still perfectly standing up to more than two meters at points three meters in height, more than two meters wide. The, the monument that was coming to light in the 70s was immediately perceived as something really important. And as such, uh, work immediately uh, started also for its preservation. Okay, so, so normally we're more concerned in pulling to light things, but there immediately Pugliesi, Alba Palmieri and Marcella Frangipane understood that this was so exceptional that it had to be preserved. And so together with the archaeologists since the 1970s, restorers and conservators coming from Italy have been working with us. Um, Paintings on the walls came soon to, to, to light, were uncovered. Uh, so as you see, these were the temporary protective roofs that have been used. Um, okay, uh, this, is, this is the phase uh, that dated to late Calcolithic V, to which, or thanks to which, today uh, Arzalantepe is in the UNESCO heritage list. Mm? But I shall describe to you the meaning of this phase uh, in a little while, because I want to start in chronological order, okay? So this was the most monumental discovery that started coming to light in the 70s, but you will see that uh, it is so big that, in fact, the whole palatial complex, because it is a palatial complex, um, finally was exposed only 40 years later. Um, but I shall put this to the side a second because I want to go a little bit back in time. I want to uh, briefly tell you something about the phases that precede late Calcolithic V. Uh, so, the, the earliest phases that we have excavated at the site, as I said, belong to the beginning of the 5th millennium uh, and they were found in a relatively small area to the western side of the mound and they are mainly domestic occupation phases, okay, courtyards, uh, houses with kitchens, ovens and normal uh, installations that you would expect in domestic contexts. Here you see an image of those. Uh, this is a kitchen with an oven and hearths. So the kind of occupation that we found is something which recalls uh, normal, typical uh, domestic and daily activities with utensils of uh, all sorts related to manipulation of food, conservation of food, and so on. Um, the pottery of this uh, phase um, is interesting in two respects. First of all, uh, here on the bottom right, you see the first testimonies of um, mass-produced bowls. So we are in the late, at the beginning of the late Calcolithic, this means immediately after Ubaid period. And you probably know that Ubaid, towards the end of Ubaid, is when we start having mass produced bowls that are used for the distribution of food. So even though what we have uncovered in Azlantepe in this period um, doesn't uh, illustrate at all a change in complexity within the site. So uh, we just have a domestic area. We don't know anything about possible public areas or elite versus common uh, people's um, residences. We do have testimony that uh, there is a beginning or or a continuation rather, since we know it from previous Ubaid sites, um, in this uh, system of uh, distribution of goods to work workers. Mm? The rest of the pottery shows relations of the site with southwest regions to the southwest. Uh, so here you have an idea. Um, so Arzalantepe has a local uh, 
typically local um, community, but uh, its uh, pottery indicates contacts and interactions to the regions of the southwest, uh, namely to the Amuk region. Um, what happens after late Calcolithic 1 and 2? We get into uh, period 7, late Calcolithic 3 and 4. In terms of Mesopotamian chronology, we are, uh, so the fourth millennium, it's contemporary to Uruk period. Okay, so uh, late Calcolithic 1 and 2 would be early Uruk, 3 and 4 would be middle, middle Uruk, and late Calcolithic 5 is late Uruk. Mm -hmm. uh, so it is interesting to see the developments uh, in the site organization during this fourth millennium and think of them also in parallel to what is happening in southern Mesopotamia, where during the Uruk period, you surely all know, we are assisting to increasing complexity in the organization of settlements, in that case also to an urbanization process, which then brings to the beginning of state. Mm. Uh, in Aslan Tepe, we see something that uh, is somehow very similar, even though there is no urban uh, development at uh, our site. So what happens uh, between period eight and period seven? Uh, the first important change is an increase in dimension of the site, okay? Period eight, uh, we don't know the exact extension, but we are sure that it doesn't cover the whole mound. In period seven, the whole mound is occupied. And the other interesting aspect is that uh, we have excavated different areas on the mound belonging to this phase. And we have uh, found that common people were living in a distant, segregated, separate area to that of the elites. Mm -hmm. So uh, period seven testifies for an increase in uh, social complexity at the site. And I will, oops, sorry, I went backwards. I will show you click quickly why we know this. These are the domestic structures that have been found in the northern area of the mound, a rather irregular in plan. They're made of uh, two or three different rooms. Uh, in the courtyards, there's shared ovens used for food manipulation. Um, but when we compare them with the residences that we have found in the central or southwestern part of the mound, uh, the difference is very evident. So here, plans are regular, the houses are normally made of two uh, separate spaces, one large room and then small uh, rooms to the side. Uh, walls are thicker, uh, houses are larger in dimension and the materials that we find inside them also testify for a social distinction difference with uh, the people who were living in the northern part of the mound. Uh, another interesting aspect is that the residences in the elite area, the so-called elite area, are built uh, with a whole sort of uh, street system also around the buildings. So we have uh, uh, subsequent levels of houses that are uh, around which we have uh, cobbled streets. And the whole area, the whole elite area is organized in this way. Um, another important uh, find uh, dated to this level, uh, so the late Calcolithic 3 and 4, is a public area. Um, a public area in which we have found two uh, large monumental buildings that have been interpreted as temples. So Temple C and Temple D. Here you see a reconstruction of Temple C. Uh, they are at the edge of the mound, so they were certainly visible from around the plain. Uh, we have, on the basis of the uh, dimensions of the walls, we have hypothesized the height of at least 12 meters. So as you see, extremely visible and open to the surrounding plain. Uh, Temple C is also very interesting in terms of uh, construction techniques. Uh, it is 25 by 25 meters in dimension and it's built on a platform uh, the, at the base of which we have wooden poles 
horizontal put horizontally within a 30 centimeter thick mud uh, preparation on top of these uh, wooden beams are is the stone platform so a very uh, strange if you want a um, foundation technique to this building that doesn't have any similarities as of yet uh, today within the Mesopotamian or Peri-Mesopotamian world. Um, in front of Temple D, in the earliest phase of, of uh, use of this temple, there is an, uh, an open area with a bur burial ground. And this is also something peculiar, certainly linked to ceremonial aspects that might have been taking place in this area. Um, here you see a reconstruction of the interior of these two temples. And uh, as you can see, the main content of the temples uh, were bowls, these mass-produced bowls that are now extremely abundant at the site. Uh, and uh, we have counted in Temple C at least 1,000 bowls left for on the floor, some to be used in a lateral room, some that had been used uh, lying on the ground in the central, in the central room of the, of the temple. Um, in the lateral rooms of both temples, uh, cretule, so ceilings have been found and the combination of the ceilings and the bowls testifies for a redistribution of food taking place in these buildings uh, where food was then consumed ceremonially uh, in a communal um, uh, commensal event. Uh, these uh, kind of events are very well known from other sites in Mesopotamia proper um, and are certainly used by uh, the elites to legitimize and reiterate uh, unequal forms of power, so increase their power um, within the Arslantepe community. So as you see from uh, phase eight, beginning of late Calcolithic, in which we don't have very clear evidence of social complexity at the site, this is a period in which instead there is a, a very evident um, increase in complexity with elites taking over power and increasing more and more their power as time goes on. Uh, this is just to show you the capacity of the bowls, there's a lot of literature on this also, again, uh, in Mesopotamian context. These bowls are more or less all of the same size, generally less than one uh, liter in capacity. So food, in fact, is distributed in the form of ration because everybody is getting the same amount of food. Um, to comment a little bit more on the role of the elites in Arzantebe period 7, here you see uh, the analysis of obsidian procurement areas and um, the regions from which obsidian is coming to Arzantebe are very wide, so we have a lot of obsidian from the east and northeast, and, but also from central Anatolia. And this is suggesting in, uh, intense relations of the community with surrounding uh, regions. Uh, the other important aspect is that we have testimony of napping of obsidian only in the elite areas. So this gives us the impression that it is the elites that are controlling these exchange routes and uh, interactions with neighboring and not so neighboring regions. Uh, likewise with metal, we have evidence of metal production at, uh, in this period uh, from polymetallic ores that uh, again, come from the northeastern areas towards the Caucasus and towards the um, Black Sea. And the uh, utensils for metallurgical production all come from the elite areas. What else is the elite, are the elites controlling? Uh, this is, um, I'm giving you a couple of different examples of uh, research and an analysis just to show you the variety of work that is taking place at the site. 
This is the work carried out by the botanists, the archaeobotanists, and through isotopic analysis, they have identified. Uh, so here you have uh, the different phases of occupation. They have measured the isotope values of carbon and nitrogen, and this gives an indication of irrigate possible irrigation and manuring. And what is interesting is that when we start from the early phases, so from here you see period eight, our beginning of late Calcolithic, uh, barley and wheat do not indicate uh, irrigation and they do not indicate manuring. But when we start moving from to the end of our period seven, here you see these uh, samples date to the phase of the temples, which I have just shown you. Here we have clear indication of irrigation taking place. So possibly, if we put all these data together, what we have interpreted is that the elites are also somehow controlling agricultural production and they are thus irrigating and manuring fields to increase production or maybe and they are increasing production, maybe also because they have an increase in population in this phase. Um, in terms of external relations uh, that are easily seen through pottery uh, production, the majority of the assemblage is local. Mm -hmm. uh, again, uh, main, the main contacts uh, look towards southwest, so the Amuk area. But interestingly, we also have some elements that recall North Mesopotamia and others that recall Central Anatolia. So uh, from the pottery assemblage, from the obsidian and from the metal ores, we see that relations and interaction of Arzvantepe as the late Calcolithic goes on have increased and are really intense with many areas all over 360 degrees around the site. Um, so what happens in the next phase? Okay, this is uh, late Calcolithic five, towards the end of the fourth millennium, contemporary to uh, late Uruk in southern uh, Mesopotamia. The first thing that we notice is that the settlement becomes small again. Okay, so uh, it is no longer occupied on its entire extent. But uh, we have 6A, so late Calcolithic 5, uh, levels of occupation only in this quarter uh, of, the, of the settlement. Uh, and what is there? This is, um, so in the place, in the same spot that during period 7 was the public area with the two temples and the open space burial, uh, a palatial complex is built. Mm -hmm. uh, and I shall explain to you why we call this as a, a, a palatial complex by describing all the different spaces uh, by which it is composed. Okay, here you see the plan in its uh, total extent as it is today, after 40 years of being uncovered and brought to light. It is not finished, as you can see, to the south and to the east. Certainly, there is more of this uh, complex to be uncovered. Uh, for the moment, it is approximately 4,000 meters square in dimension. Uh, again, monumental, certainly well visible from the plain. Uh, here you get a view of the plain and imagine people were not living at the site any longer. People had been moved away. There was no houses in the uh, Azlantepe uh, settlement during period 6a. The only residences that we have found are these two next to the palace and directly related to a back entrance door to the palace and so they were surely belonging to elites, to people, to officers that were working inside the palace. The common people were not living at the site. They were out in the plain. They were in rural contexts outside. Um, so this is the extent of the palace that we have today. It is built in different terraces that correspond to the different slopes of the mound. Um, and as you can see, it is actually built in different 
buildings. Mm? So the, the palatial complex has grown in time. Uh, it has a core area, mm? which was the earliest part to be built. Um, and slowly it increased, so parts have been added to the palace uh, in the 300 years of life that this palace has had. This core area that you see here uh, is composed by one uh, monumental building, which we have called the audience hall. In front of the audience hall is a courtyard. Um, and here you see it as it is preserved today. Uh, this is the place where the chief would receive people, would receive the community. Um, the plan of this uh, throne area, this is how we have interpreted it, is, is exactly the same as second millennium palaces in uh, the middle of Euphrates, for example, at the site of Mari. So there is a platform with three steps, uh, which is right in the front of this building here you see it again people would probably stop in this courtyard area there is a couple of steps in front exactly in front of this platform we imagine that uh, the chief would sit uh, over here and those who could come who would come and talk to him and be received by him or her sorry would uh, stop in these different steps according to their hierarchy uh, level. Uh, here you see a close-up of the reconstruction and the inside of the, set, the central room of this uh, audience hall um, in which we do not think that uh, people had access to. Um, there is another large platform in here which has a fire on it. Mm -hmm. uh, that is why you see the color coming from the, the fire coming from the back windows okay so uh, the chief would sit here and have light from the fire coming out from the sides of these two windows um slowly by slowly different parts have been added to the palatial complex and uh at the end of its uh, life of use, this is how it looks like. There is a long corridor moving uphill. You see it also here from the entrance, the gate entrance of the palace that leads to the courtyard. So leads to where people would be received by the chief. Mm -hmm. And in fact, uh, there is a, a clear visibility from the gate exactly to the throne, right? So uh, in the way this building, this monumental complex was built, um, symbolism and a lot of uh, ideology was certainly also uh, thought of uh, by the architects when they were building this complex. Mm -hmm. uh, at the end of the corridor, just before getting into the courtyard, there is another important painting. Uh, here you see a drawing of it. Um, and this is uh, the typical Mesopotamian iconography with a person on a, possibly on a threshing sledge, uh, with two bulls that are pulling the thread, the, the sledge. Um, and this is, a, as I said, it's an iconography that is generally uh, related to the image of the chief that is also the person who provides food and life uh, to the community. So it's certainly not by chance that we have this painting looking towards people coming to talk to this uh, chief. And I'm using this term because I don't want to say king. Of course, we don't know what kind of political organization this was, but certainly the chief was uh, sitting in this place and um, there is a whole iconography leading up to the presence of this person as people come to be uh, received by him or her. Uh, what else is there in this palatial complex? This is a temple. There's two temples uh, on either sides of the corridor. 
this is temple B, um, and it is very different from the, the temples of the previous phase. It's different, first of all, in the fact that uh, the entrance is not an easy one. Uh, temple C and D had uh, a lot of openings and doors uh, straight into the central room. Here there is one entrance from the side and it's like a labyrinth, right? You have to move. Uh, so, so this is telling us not everybody had access into this building. Another, uh, but they did not have access, but they could see inside it, right? There is two windows here. So from the entrance, but from outside, you could sort of take a glimpse and see have an idea of what was taking place inside, but you could not go inside. Hmm? We know that access to this temple was restricted also because um, the materials inside are not bowls, but very different uh, and also prestigious uh, looking uh, ceramics. So possibly this was a place where the elites were, uh, were um, acting were uh, making some special ceremonies uh, to which not everybody had access. Storage rooms is uh, another area of the palatial complex and again here you see a reconstruction exactly of, of what exactly we have found in them okay so the containers large containers for um, the goods uh, that were held in them and in the second one in this sorry smaller of the three rooms large containers but also bowls bowls that were used to distribute uh, goods kept in the storages. Here are some images of uh, how they looked like when we found them. Here are some images of the materials after restoration. Uh, and what is also found in this, in this small third storage room are cretule, ceilings. Again, this is testifying uh, for the distribution of goods. So uh, goods, possibly food, is being distributed in the palace no longer in a temple context but from the storage rooms so the way we have understood this is that uh, the elites are giving out handing out food as a way to pay work or labor that has taken place hmm? uh, the cretule ceilings are not only in the storages but also in a small area over here that has thousands of them and that we have interpreted as a proper archive hmm? where the cretule are then put uh, after they have been counted. And so uh, there is a true accounting system that the palace uses to check who has received uh, goods and how much they have received. How are the cretule use, uh, used? This is just quickly in case you are not all familiar to this. Cretule are uh, used to seal uh, containers, be it sacks, be it uh, pots, be it doors. Mm -hmm. um, and by looking at the back side of the ceilings, we see what they have sealed. By looking at the front side, we see the impression of the seal. The seal belongs to the people. Okay, so here is to give you an idea. Workers were coming to the palace and they were receiving their ration of food as a form of payment for work that had uh, that they had performed, and that and they would seal the uh, clay lump as a receipt eat for uh, the food that they had been given. Um, these ceilings, these cretule have been studied for more than 30 years by Marcella Frangipane and by other uh, scholars from our group. And I just want to mention one uh, very interesting thing, uh, which is the hierarchy of officers that they have uh, understood on the basis of this study. Uh, so this is the seal of the highest rank person in the Arzalantepe society. Below this, per this officer come these two people, then these four, then these four, and then below them a whole lot of other people. So uh, they have understood this by looking at what these officers could seal, how many doors, how many sacks, mm? on the basis of the variety of activities that these officers could do, uh, they have hypothesized the 
uh, rank that these people had in the society. So I am running through things. I'm sorry, this is 60 years of work. I am just throwing at you some, uh, some things that then you can surely, if you're interested, uh, go and look at uh, in the many publications that we have from the site. This is the entrance to the storages. So again, paintings in a place where people would come, they would pass through and, uh, and look at these images, what they represent. Uh, we have discussed this for long. We're not sure 100%, of course, but we imagine that these are probably officers, people who are checking or shamans, uh, but they are checking on the the people that are coming into the storage rooms to receive uh, rations. Uh, here you see some close-ups just to show you the excellent state of preservation of these paintings. Um, next, there's not only paintings in the palace, but the plaster that is perfectly preserved is in some points decorated with stamp decorations that are also at times painted. What else is there in this palatial complex? Uh, weapon room uh, in it have been found what are still today the most ancient swords uh, in arsenical copper. And these testify for possibly also a military power of these elites. Mm? So this is why we call uh, Arslan Tepe in this period as a primary state system, okay? There is elites who have a complex system of administrative control over people, but also military control uh, in a way that is somehow similar to what is happening in Southern Mesopotamia in Uruk. Mm? Um, Okay, and so, and also in terms of the plan of the building, uh, it recalls, uh, as I have already said, second millennium uh, palaces in the middle of Euphrates. This is the, um, the building, the, uh, the monumental structure, uh, thanks to which uh, Arslan Tepe is now a UNESCO site. Uh, but not only because of this, uh, it is a UNESCO site because it has helped Marcella Frangipane explain the origin of state system. Uh, this is what you would see if you come to the site. Um, it is part of the panels that we have uh, made to explain the visit to the site to visitors. The site is in fact open to the public. Um, it is covered and protected. Uh, what happens then? Around 3100, the palatial complex is burnt completely. This is for us archeologists very lucky. Uh, it does, uh, determine the end of the palatial system and on the ruins of this palace we have uh, the occupation by very different people um, communities that have important links with transcaucasia they are herders uh, their structures are built in uh, wattle and daub it's huts with animal fences but they also have an important communal building um, and they are showing important links with the Transcaucasian world. Um, to this phase or to the end of this phase, but maybe to the beginning of the following, we still have a bit of complex understanding of the stratigraphy. Here belongs uh, a chiefly tomb, uh, another important discovery that has taken place in the 90s. Um, one chief is buried with four adolescents uh, that have been sacrificed on top of the tomb, uh, offers uh, and ornaments inside this uh, burial are uh, just marvelous. Here you have just a, an idea of the variety of objects that have been found inside here. It is a cyst grave and so um, and has a mixture of elements that recall both the Transcaucasian uh, local, um, local ceramic assemblages. So it is a true mix of uh, cultural elements. And what happens in at the Zanatepe immediately after this is, in fact, a return to a very local kind of uh, community. Um, 
a whole village of farmers and herders have been has been discovered uh, there is a citadel inside a fortified wall at the center and so it is uh, narrating a story that will last the whole early bronze age uh, of the site of Arzvantepe where we have various phases following one on top of the other uh, here you see another level again a village with a fortification wall um, that is basically formed by uh, farmers and herders that live at the site uh, for the whole third millennia um, and this is what happens in the life of Arzlantepe for, uh, as I said, early Bronze Age, Middle Bronze Age as well, until uh, in the late Bronze Age, Arzlantepe comes into the sphere of, of influence of the Hittite world. Uh, and so this is a moment in which we see a change uh, in the settlement and we start having uh, the presence, clear presence of uh, Hittite um, uh, Hittite people, Hittite uh, community, the site will be in within the borders of the Hittite Empire and at the collapse of the Hittite Empire it, belong, it becomes the capital of a new Hittite state of uh, Melid. Uh, so the Italian excavations had started here looking for these phases in the 70s when uh, excavation moved to the prehistoric levels, the Hittite phases were abandoned by uh, the Italian team, but in 2008 we started again excavating the northern side of the mound and we have now come to the uh, Iron Age levels and slowly important monumental very interesting monumental buildings are coming to light and reliefs that uh, were probably part of the entrance gates to the city um, and this is something where we have now again con concentrated our research. Uh, this is a very recent picture from this uh, season of excavation, again an Iron Age building. Uh, we are still very um, uh, uh, shallow from topsoil and these buildings for the moment are found empty with no materials inside them, but we uh, are we sure that when we uh, will continue below these phases we will reach hopefully very interesting Iron Age and then late uh, Bronze Age levels too. Uh, to conclude, so uh, in the coming years uh, we will concentrate our research both on these Iron Age levels uh, which we are sure will be very promising, but also on the other side, on the northeastern side of the mound, on the levels that precede the late Calcolithic that I have very quickly uh, described to you, looking, pointing down to Ubaid phases and possibly also to the Neolithic. So we still have a lot of excavation and work to do, uh, and hopefully we will be able to go on for yet very many years. All right, with this I will stop. I am sorry for this massive amount of information and pictures that I've given to you, but I just hope that this is sort of something that will uh, stimulate your interest and uh, you are welcome to ask any questions uh, or even later write to me to have indications for readings that you might um, uh, want suggested to deepen the understanding of some of the things that I have run through very quickly. Thank you very much, uh, Francesca, for this uh, clear presentation. I mean, you survey of the whole history of the site and also the history of your uh, excavations. Maybe uh, we could close your... Um... Yes, I'm trying to do that. Sorry. Oh, okay. Yes, here I am. So, thank you very much. So, now, I mean, let us go to, to questions and uh, uh, comments. I mean, uh, whoever would like to speak, yes, I, uh, please, you, you write in the chat or you just uh, take the microphone. Yes, I see Thomas. <laughs> I <immediately> oh, yeah. <laughs> Hello. Yeah. Um, if I may. Uh, uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, thank you. Thank you for this wonderful presentation and the beautiful visuals and uh, just to take us on this tour expanding over several thousand years. Uh, I have uh, a few uh, questions because um, 
this, these swords are extremely intriguing. Well, probably you get tired of people just talking about these swords, but they're really fascinating <laughs> and still pretty unique uh, to some certain uh, to a certain extent. Um, you you know we we have them not only there, but uh, now there's a very new one that was presented by colleagues from Venice uh, from the Doge collection. Uh, we published also one that was erroneously filed as a Roman knife <laughs> in the Tokat Museum some years ago. So there, there are a few examples. And there's another one that we just uh, discovered in the Konya Museum, which might also belong to this uh, to this uh, odd uh, flat sword. Um, I, I'm just wondering, are there, are there any indicators that they were eventually manufactured on site, some conspicuous molds because they were cast in an open mold and then the decorations were chiseled off, which is very weird. And they're completely flat, which is also interesting because you can't really, well, you can grasp them, but it's not a very comfortable grip because they're completely flat. But obviously people use them also to some certain extent. So that would be my, my first question. Um, the, the second one is related to the to the metal composition. Uh, you mentioned that also that this is arsenical copper high in nickel, which is typical for ophiolitic rocks. Uh, well, there are some ophiolitic bells also close to Aslan Tepe, and and further much further down the south in Oman. But that's probably now you can disregard it. But probably also local sources might have been exploited uh, to produce them. The last thing is a bit of a heretic question. <laughs> uh, this, these uh, seal impressions are great. I have to, I have to check. I have to read the book. I have to, to uh, read about that. Um, so, the idea of this hierarchy uh, is related, as, I, as far as I understood, to the frequency of the impression. So, what was actually what was sealed, and how many goods and different goods were sealed with them. Might it, is there a possibility that this might be completely the other way around in terms of that the, the messenger boys on the lowest rank in the society there had to seal all kinds of stuff and only a very few elite members were allowed to seal very, very few things with not a very broad range of, of different goods. Okay, I talked a lot. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay. Uh, for this um, so thank you for the questions. Uh, all of them would uh, need at least an hour of discussions. So let me try to say something really synthetic. Uh, the swords, indeed, when they were found, this was a big shock. At the beginning, people did not, I mean, scholars did not believe that they were dated so early. But today, as you say, many others have been found. And so there's no issue on this, right? Um, uh, there is also a very recent one that was found in Tokat, uh, in the Tokat area on a salvage excavation so out of context uh, but this is getting so it's mm -hmm. we're getting the feeling that both in terms of composition and both and in terms of their uh, shape so the style it is something that is related with the uh, black sea area okay so mm -hmm. to the north and northeast of Aslantepe and this uh, also coincides with the sources because these uh, are second arsenical copper with nickel sources have been demonstrated that come from that area too. The local sources that we have are definitely not the ones used for these metals uh, we know this also on the basis of uh, a change in metallograph in the production of metal within the site, because when we get to the early Bronze Age, uh, when the palace system collapses and all its relations with out with faraway lands also decrease. So we sort of, it gets like to be localized kind of community. Uh, we have a change in the composition and there it is local metals that are being used. So these metals are not local. 
Whether the, the swords are made in Arslan Tepe or not, this is a difficult issue that we haven't solved yet because we don't have any proof of, met of production, of metal mm -hmm. production, since we have only excavated the palatial context. If they were producing metals, it was not there, of course. Mm -hmm. So we are un unable at the moment to say whether they were producing them locally or whether these had arrived ready-made. Mm -hmm. yeah. You also mentioned the fact that they are flat, they are difficult to hold in hand. We do not think that these swords were, were used. We think that these swords were there on the wall in this room to be shown, to, um, to show the power that the site had. That the, okay, because, because the silver inlay on the hilt where you on, where on the handle okay uh, would not have been visible of course you have leather on it you're yeah, never going to hold a sword in your hand holding the metal part okay mm -hmm. so the fact that there is silver inlays on the hilt uh, is also a suggestion to us that these were probably not used but they had made they had been made expressly to be exposed, to be shown in the palace. Uh, the, the way they have been found is also uh, suggesting this because they were all bundled together and mm -hmm. they have been found underneath a collapsed wall. So we have interpreted them as if they had been hanging on the wall, okay? Mm -hmm. Which would also testify again to mm -hmm. the fact that they were not used. Mm. Um, if I can move to yeah. the ceilings <laughs> now, if I haven't forgotten something oh. with these words. Mm. Uh, so, Iki has been hypothesized not on the basis of these people have sealed objects, but on the variety of not only objects, but doors mm -hmm. that they have sealed. Okay. okay? By studying the back impression of the Cretule, we have recognized at least three different type of doors, which we believe must have been three doors of the palace. So uh, the seals that you have seen illustrated in the slides are those of the only people who could seal doors. Mm -hmm. None of the other seals, there's more than 250 mm -hmm. seals at the site, uh, okay, so more than 250 people have been sealing inside these storage rooms, uh, but the ones that you saw are the only ones who have actually sealed doors. And so this is the first indication to us that they must be the more important people because they don't only seal containers and so possibly food stuff or, or um, yeah, foodstuffs, uh, but they can also close the storage rooms or whatever rooms. Uh, and then within these, the hierarchy uh, is based on the variety of containers and the number of doors that they close. So top person closes three, all three doors and all containers. The ones below close two doors and some containers. Then the third hierarchy close one type of door. Mm -hmm. So this is why we think that we have reconstructed the system mm -hmm. the way that I have illustrated. Mm -hmm. um, oh, okay, so, uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, just to clarify one, one little thing, this very new sort you mentioned from the Tokat region. Mm -hmm. uh, this is uh, this is of course not the one that we published some years ago, which was in the in the museum collection of Tokat and mislabeled. No. It's a, it's something completely new. Okay. This was two years ago, uh -huh. um, and it was brought. They were doing some road construction. Okay. You must know better than me. I'm, I uh, well, I, no, I read I, well, about that, this no, on I, the news. No, I don't. I don't. So and, a, okay. I will write you. <laughs> okay. Uh, I will find the information I had then. It was okay. the, there was some road construction, and okay. the the workman just found it and brought it to the museum. But it's okay. something very new. Okay, great, thank you. I, I will I will write you. <laughs> okay. okay, thanks a lot. Thank you. Any other question? No, I mean I don't see. A... Well, then I, I will ask... I'm sorry, I just said too many things. <laughs> <laughs>
It's <laughs> I don't think so. It's so, a mass of data in No, no, it's because it was very clear and very complete. I feel that there's no no question. So I have a question which is of not not related I mean, to uh, the findings because I'm completely ignorant and my question would be probably irrelevant. It's a question about uh, your work uh, in the uh, for uh, community archaeology. I mean your, your work with the community. So I mean uh, what are you uh, doing? How did you get uh, people of the surrounding to be involved in the excavation besides the workers obviously but uh, do you have any um, other strategies that uh, the local people are really taking care of the site and then probably you don't have illegal excavation or if you have which is possible very very few i mean so what is your strategy for that uh okay so um as to the illegal excavations and the people taking care of the site i must say that this is it's always been like this since the 1960s uh, i mean there is a community that is really taking care of that place and uh, we have no knowledge whatsoever of any illegal excavation taking place at the site zero um, now it is a museum of course and so there's uh given leak there's guardians there and, and this means that of course now everything is absolutely controlled but it has been like this since uh, since always i'm uh, i could say at least since we are there um as to uh, the work that we have uh, been doing to try and involve the community, this all started in uh, 2015 when we participated to the Gelejek Tourism Day uh, project. Uh, so it's a uh, we got some funding that was expressly uh, related to increasing the knowledge uh, about the site, and we decided to do this working with the local community so we got together with all uh, local stakeholders which meant uh, you know starting from the muktar uh, and so all the community people but then moving up into the city to uh, administration and also the university of malatya so we got a, a big range of people working with us on this topic and the first thing that we we did was just simply inform information so we started organizing seminars and uh, workshops with all different uh, categories of people um, school teachers uh, high school teach uh, professors of history and of art uh, primary school teachers and the idea was uh, that if we brought them to the site and showed them the site and explained to them what they could do with their students then they would work on it uh, and so it started off in this way um, and then um, when uh, the Inonu University was involved um, we started having meetings with local people in Orduzu mm -hmm. uh, uh, making community maps uh, and we met the women separated from the men of course because this made it easier to communicate um, uh, men already knew about Arslan Tepe very well because they were the workmen right so every family in Orduzu has had at least one person working at Arslan Tepe um, and this really made an important link with the site but when we started working on this project uh, we noticed that uh, quite often the women didn't know very much about Arslan Tepe because their husbands would not talk about what was going on at the site when they were back home and when we understood this we thought uh, that women were for us in fact the most important um, um, category of people uh, because they teach to their children uh, and because that would really make the whole families uh, included in those into this big community mm -hmm. So we went on with the project. We named the project um, Toplum Arslan Tepei Sahi Plenior. 
So people are taking care of Arslan Tepe and we worked on it this way. So we were, um, we went into these houses, we went to the women and we are mostly women. So as archeologists in Arslan Tepe, oh, there's male and female archeologists, but there is a big component of female in our, in our group. And this also helped us because we could go inside, we could go and talk to the women and we could uh, start communicating with them and show them how Arslan Tepe had shown some things about their past and what was important about it. Uh, and so it's something that is growing, okay? We are, we're still working on this, um, but our aim is truly both that uh, everybody in the Orduzu community and then in the wider Malatya city knows about the site and feels that the site is there. It's part of their past, part of their heritage. Um, only at that point we can sh we, be we think we can share with them also our research uh, aims and choices. Before then, scientific research is one thing and community is another thing, okay? But they, they are certainly part of all the process of conservation and, uh, and um, uh, valor valorization, is this Italian, sorry, uh, of the, the, their heritage. Hmm? Thank you very much. Very, very interesting, actually, and uh, I'm sure very successful. I mean, to to have the whole uh, area to be involved in the, in that process. Any other question? No. So then, I mean, we are going to to uh, close our uh, session. Thank you very much again. I mean, to uh, to you, Francesca, and to everyone who <laughs> came and participated to this uh, meeting. So I wish to all of you uh, a good evening. <laughs>